John Reginald Halliday Christie, known to his family and friends as Reg Christie, was an English serial killer and alleged necrophile active during the 1940s and early 1950s. Christie murdered at least eight people, including his wife, Ethel, by strangling them in his flat at 10, Rillington Place, Notting Hill, London. The bodies of three of Christie's victims were found in a wallpaper-covered kitchen alcove soon after he had moved out of Rillington Place during March 1953. The remains of two more victims were discovered in the garden, and his wife's body was found beneath the floorboards in the front room. Christie was arrested and convicted of his wife's murder, for which he was hanged. Two of Christie's victims were Beryl Evans and her baby daughter Geraldine, who, along with Beryl's husband Timothy Evans, were tenants at 10, Rillington Place during 1948-49. This case sparked huge controversy after Evans was charged with both murders, found guilty of the murder of his daughter, and hanged in 1950. Christie was a major prosecution witness, when his own crimes were discovered three years later, serious doubts were raised about the integrity of Evans' conviction. Christie himself subsequently admitted killing Beryl, but not Geraldine. It is now generally accepted that Christie murdered both Beryl and Geraldine and that police mishandling of the original inquiry allowed Christie to escape detection and enabled him to murder four more women. In 2004 the High Court acknowledged that Evans did not murder either his wife or his child. Early Life John Christie was born in Northoram near Halifax in the West Riding of Yorkshire, the sixth in a family of seven children. He had a troubled relationship with his father, carpet designer Ernest John Christie. An austere and uncommunicative man who displayed little emotion towards his children and would punish them for trivial offenses. John was also alternately coddled and bullied by his mother and older sisters. On March 24, 1911, Christie's grandfather David Halliday died aged 75 in Christie's house after a long illness. Christie later said that seeing his grandfather's body laid out on a trestle table gave him a feeling of power and well-being, a man he had once feared was now only a corpse. At the age of 11, Christie won a scholarship to Halifax Secondary School, where his favorite subject was mathematics, particularly algebra. He was also good at history and woodwork. It was later found that Christie had an IQ of 128. Christie also attended Boothtown Council School in Northoram. He sang in the church choir and was a Boy Scout. After leaving school on April 22, 1913, he entered employment as an assistant projectionist. During his later life, Christie's childhood peers described him as a queer lad who kept himself to himself and was not very popular. His problem with impotence began in adolescence, his first attempts at sex were failures, and he was branded Reggie No Dick and Can't Do It Christie by his peers. Christie's sexual difficulties were lifelong, most of the time he could only perform with prostitutes. In September 1916, during the First World War, Christie enlisted in the British Army. He was called up on April 12, 1917 to join the 52nd Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire Regiment to serve as an infantryman. In April 1918, the regiment was dispatched to France, where Christie was seconded to the Duke of Wellington's regiment as a signalman. During the following June, Christie was injured in a mustard gas attack and spent a month in a military hospital in Calais. He later claimed this attack had rendered him blind and mute for three and a half years, and permanently impacted his ability to speak loudly. Ludovic Kennedy wrote that no record of Christie's blindness has been traced and that, while he might have lost his voice when he was admitted to hospital, he would not have been discharged as fit for duty had he remained a mute, his inability to talk loudly, Kennedy argued, was a psychological reaction to the gassing rather than a lasting toxic effect of the gas, the reaction, and Christie's exaggeration of the effects of the attack, stemmed from an underlying personality disorder that caused him to exaggerate or feign illness as a ploy to get attention and sympathy. Christie was demobilized from the army on October 22, 
1919. He joined the Royal Air Force on December 13, 1923, but was discharged on August 15, 1924. Marriage Christy married Ethel Simpson, from Bradford, at Halifax Town's Register Office on 10 May 1920. His impotence remained, and he continued to visit prostitutes, early in the marriage. Ethel suffered a miscarriage, after four years of marriage the couple separated. Ethel worked at the Garside Engineering Co. on Ironbridge Road in Bradford, and later worked at the English Electrical Co. on Thornton Road, also in Bradford, until 1928. That year, Ethel and her siblings moved to Sheffield. In 1923, Christy moved to London, he spent the next decade in and out of prison, while Ethel remained in Yorkshire with her relatives. He was released from prison in January 1934, when the couple reunited and moved into 10, Rillington Place. Early Criminal Activity During the first decade of his marriage to Ethel, Christie was convicted of several criminal offenses. He began working as a postman on January 10, 1921 in Halifax, and his first conviction was for stealing postal orders on February 20 and March 26 for which he received three months' imprisonment on April 12, 1921. He served his sentence at H.M. Prison Manchester and was released on June 27. Christie was then convicted on January 15, 1923 of obtaining money on false pretenses and of violent conduct, for which, respectively, he was bound over and placed on probation for 12 months. He committed two further crimes of larceny during 1924, and received consecutive sentences of three and six months imprisonment on September 22, 1924 in H.M. Prison Wandsworth. On May 13, 1929, after working for over two years as a lorry driver, Christie was convicted of assaulting Maud Cole, with whom he was living at 6, Almeric Road in Battersea, and was sentenced to six months hard labor. He had hit Cole over the head with a cricket bat, which the magistrate described as a murderous attack for which he was again sent to H.M. Prison Wandsworth. Finally, Christie was convicted of auto theft and was re-imprisoned in H.M. Prison Wandsworth for three months on November 1, 1933. Christie and Ethel were reconciled in 1934 after he was released from prison, but he continued to visit prostitutes. He ended his recourse to petty crime. In 1937 the Christies moved into the top floor flat of 10, Rillington Place in Notting Hill, then a rather run-down area of London, they later moved into the ground floor flat in December 1938. The house was a three-story brick end terrace. Built in the 1870s during a period of intensive speculative building in the area resulting in much jerry-built property which declined into poorly maintained and unimproved multi-occupancy rentals. Number 10 was of a common design, the ground and first floors each contained a bedroom and living room, with a kitchen scullery in the adjacent extension, but the second floor flat had two rooms only. A kitchen living room and a bedroom. Living conditions were squalid, the building's occupants shared one outside lavatory, and none of the flats had a bathroom. The street was close to an above-ground section of the London Underground's Metropolitan Line. And the train noise would have been deafening for the occupants of 10, Rillington Place. After three years of working as a foreman at the Commodore Cinema in King Street, Hammersmith, at the beginning of the Second World War, Christie applied to join the War Reserve Police and was accepted. The authorities failed to check for the existence of a criminal record, he was assigned to the Harrow Road Police Station, where he met a woman called Gladys Jones with whom he began an affair. Their relationship lasted until mid-1943, when the woman's husband, a serving soldier, returned from the war. After learning of the affair, he went to the house where his wife was living, discovered Christie there, and assaulted him. Murders Christie committed his murders over a 10-year period between 1943 and 1953, usually by strangling his victims after he had rendered them unconscious with domestic gas. Some he raped as they lay unconscious. First Murders 
The first person Christie admitted to killing was Ruth First, a 21-year-old Austrian munitions worker who supplemented her income by occasionally engaging in prostitution. Christie claimed to have met First while she was soliciting clients in a snack bar in Ladbroke Grove. According to his own statements, on August 24, 1943, he invited First to his home to engage in sex. Afterward, Christie impulsively strangled her on his bed with a length of rope. He initially stowed First's body beneath the floorboards of his living room. Soon after the murder, at the end of 1943, Christie resigned as a special constable his service index card is now on display at the Metropolitan Police Museum. Whilst evidence from his murders now forms part of the crime museum collections. The following year he found new employment as a clerk at an Acton radio factory. There he met his second victim, colleague Muriel Amelia Eady. On 7 October 1944, he invited Edie back to his flat with the promise that he had concocted a special mixture that could cure her bronchitis. Edie was to inhale the mixture from a jar with a tube inserted in the top. The mixture in fact was Friar's balsam, which Christie used to disguise the smell of domestic gas. Once Edie was seated breathing the mixture from the tube with her back turned, Christie inserted a second tube into the jar connected to a gas tap. As Edie continued breathing she inhaled the domestic gas, which soon rendered her unconscious. Domestic gas during the 1940s was coal gas, which had a carbon monoxide content of 15%. Christie raped and strangled Edie before burying her alongside first. Murders of Beryl and Geraldine Evans During Easter of 1948, Timothy Evans and his wife Beryl moved into the top floor flat at 10, Rillington Place, where Beryl gave birth that October to their daughter, Geraldine. In late 1949, Evans informed police that his wife was dead. A police search of the building failed to find her body, but a later search revealed the bodies of Beryl, Geraldine, and a 16-week male fetus in an outdoor wash house. Beryl's body had been wrapped twice, in a blanket and then a tablecloth. The postmortem revealed that both mother and daughter had been strangled and that Beryl had been physically assaulted before her death. Shown by facial bruising, Evans at first claimed that Christie had killed his wife in a botched abortion operation, but police questioning eventually produced a confession. The alleged confession may have been fabricated by the police, as the statement appears contrived and artificial. After being charged, Evans withdrew his confession and once again accused Christie, this time of both murders. On January 11, 1950, Evans was put on trial for the murder of his daughter, the prosecution having decided not to pursue a second charge of murdering his wife. Christie was a principal witness for the Crown. He denied Evans' accusations and gave detailed evidence about the quarrels between him and his wife the jury found Evans guilty despite the revelation of Christie's criminal record of theft and violence. Evans was originally due to be hanged on January 31st, but appealed. After his appeal on February 20th had failed, Evans was hanged at H.M. Prison Pendenville on March 9, 1950. At the time of Evans' trial, Christie had found a job at the Post Office Savings Bank on May 21st. 1946 as a grade 2 clerk and worked at Q. He was sacked when his past criminal record came to light, leaving on April 4, 1950. Mistakes in the investigation Police made several mistakes in their handling of the Evans case, especially in overlooking the remains of Christie's previous murder victims in the garden at 10, Rillington Place. One femur was later found propping up a fence. The garden of the property was very small, about 16 by 14 feet, and the fence was parallel to the wash house where the bodies of Beryl and Geraldine were later found. Several searches were made at the house after Evans confessed to placing his wife's remains in the drains, but the three policemen conducting the search did not go into the wash house. The garden was apparently examined but was not excavated at this point. Christie later admitted that his dog had unearthed Edie's skull in the garden shortly after these police searches, he threw the skull into an abandoned bombed-out house in nearby Street Marks Road. 
there was clearly no systematic search made of the crime scene in which this or other human remains would have been found and pointed to Christie as the perpetrator. Several police searches of the property showed a complete lack of expertise in handling forensic evidence and were quite superficial at best. Had the searches been conducted effectively, the investigation would have exposed Christie as a murderer, and the lives of Evans and four women would have been saved. The evidence of builders working at Rillington Place was ignored, and their interviews with Evans suggest that the police concocted a false confession. It should have been clear from the first statement made by Evans on November 30, 1949 that he was ignorant of the resting place of the body of his wife or how she had been killed. He claimed that his wife's body was in either a manhole or a drain at the front of the house, but a police search failed to find remains there. That should have prompted a thorough search of the residence, wash house and garden, but no further action was taken until later, when the two bodies were found in the wash house. Evans was also unaware at his first interview that his daughter had been killed. The police interrogation in London was mishandled from the start, when they showed him the clothes of his wife and baby and revealed that they had been found in the wash house. Such information should have been kept from him so as to force him to tell police where the bodies had been concealed. The several apparent confessions contain questionable words and phrases in high-register language such as terrific argument which seem out of place for a distressed, uneducated, working-class young man such as Evans and bear no relation to what he probably said. These were almost certainly inventions made much later by the police, according to comments made by Ludovic Kennedy long after the truth about Christie had emerged. Police accepted all of Christie's statements as true without major scrutiny and he was the crucial witness at the trial of Evans. As Kennedy wrote, the police accepted Christie, a former war reserve policeman, as one of their own, largely taking what he said on face value without any further investigation. Bearing in mind Christie had criminal convictions for theft and malicious wounding, the reliance on his testimony was questionable. It is significant that Christie had claimed to be an abortionist prior to his meeting the Evanses, having said so to a colleague in 1947. He also repeated this claim after Timothy Evans' trial to women he spoke to in cafes, whom he possibly regarded as potential victims. Such an approach aligns with Christie's modus operandi of offering help to women so as to gain their confidence and lure them back to his flat, as demonstrated in Edie's case. Nearly three years passed without major incident for Christie after Evans' trial. He soon found alternative employment as a clerk with the British Road Services at their Shepherd's Bush Depot, starting work there on June 12, 1950. At the same time, new tenants arrived to fill the vacant first and second floor rooms at 10, Rillington Place. The tenants were predominantly migrants from the West Indies. This horrified Christie and his wife, who both held racist attitudes towards their neighbors and disliked living with them. Tensions between the new tenants and the Christies came to a head when Ethel prosecuted one of her neighbors. For assault, Christie negotiated with the poor man's lawyer center to continue to have exclusive use of the back garden. Ostensibly to have space between him and his neighbors but quite possibly to prevent anyone from uncovering the human remains buried there. Murder of Ethel Christie On the morning of December 14, 1952, Christie strangled Ethel in bed. She had last been seen in public two days earlier, Christie invented several stories to explain his wife's disappearance and to help mitigate the possibility of further inquiries being made. In reply to a letter from relatives in Sheffield, he wrote that Ethel had rheumatism and could not write herself. To one neighbor, he explained that she was visiting her relatives in Sheffield. To another, he said that she had gone to Birmingham. Christie had resigned from his job on December 6 and had been unemployed since then. To support himself, he sold Ethel's wedding ring and watch on December 17 for £2.10s in furniture on January 8, 1953 for which he received £11. He kept cutlery, two chairs, a mattress, and his kitchen table. From January 23 to March 20, he received his weekly unemployment benefit of £3.12. 
On January 26, 1953, Christie forged his wife's signature and emptied her bank account. On February 27, 1953, Christie sold some of his wife's clothing for three pounds. He also received a check for eight pounds on March 7 from the Bradford Clothing and Supply Company. Further Murders Between January 19 and March 6, 1953, Christie murdered three more women he invited back to 10, Rillington Place, Kathleen Maloney, Rita Nelson, and Hector Anna McLennan. Maloney was a prostitute from the Ladbroke Grove area. Nelson was from Belfast and was visiting her sister in Ladbroke Grove, she was six months pregnant at the time she encountered Christie. Christie first met McLennan, who was living in London with her boyfriend, Alex Baker, in a cafe. All three met on several occasions after this and Christie let McLennan and Baker stay at Rillington Place while they were looking for accommodation. On another occasion, Christie met McLennan on her own and persuaded her to come back to his flat, where he murdered her. Later he convinced Baker, who came to Rillington Place looking for McLennan, that he had not seen her. Christie kept up the pretense for several days, meeting Baker regularly to see if he had news of McLennan's whereabouts and to help him search for her. For the murders of his final three victims, Christie modified the gassing technique he had first used on Edie. He used a rubber tube connected to the gas pipe in the kitchen which he kept closed off with a bulldog clip. He seated his victims in the kitchen, released the clip on the tube, and let gas leak into the room. The Brabin report pointed out that Christie's explanation of his gassing technique was not satisfactory because he would have been overpowered by the gas as well. It was established that all three victims had been exposed to carbon monoxide. The gas made his victims drowsy, after which Christie strangled them with a length of rope. As with Edie, Christie repeatedly sexually assaulted his last three victims while they were unconscious and continued to do so as they died. When this aspect of his crimes was publicly revealed, Christie quickly gained a reputation for being a necrophiliac. One commentator has cautioned against categorizing Christie as such. According to the accounts he gave to the police, he did not engage sexually with any of his victims exclusively after death, after Christie had murdered each of his final victims by ligature strangulation. He placed a vest or other cloth-like material between their legs before wrapping their semi-naked bodies in blankets, before stowing their bodies in a small alcove behind the back kitchen wall. He later covered the entrance to this alcove with wallpaper. Arrest Christie moved out of 10, Rillington Place on March 20, 1953. After fraudulently subletting his flat to a couple from whom he took seven pounds the landlord visited that same evening and, finding the couple, there instead of Christie, demanded that they leave first thing in the morning. The landlord allowed the tenant of the top floor flat, Beresford Brown, to use Christie's kitchen. On March 24, Brown discovered the kitchen alcove when he attempted to insert brackets into the wall to hold a wireless set. Peeling back the wallpaper, Brown saw the bodies of Maloney, Nelson and McLennan. After getting confirmation from another tenant in Rillington Place that they were dead bodies, Brown informed the police and a citywide search for Christie began. After leaving Rillington Place, Christie had gone to a Roten house in King's Cross and booked a room for seven nights under his real name and address. He stayed for only four nights, leaving on March 24 when news broke of the discovery at his flat. Christie wandered around London, slept rough and spent much of the day in cafes and cinemas. On March 28, he pawned his watch in Battersea for tens. On the morning of March 31, Christie was arrested on the embankment near Putney Bridge after being challenged about his identity by a police officer, P.C. Thomas Ledger. When the police searched Christie, they discovered an old newspaper clipping about the remand of Timothy Evans among the personal items on him. Conviction and Execution Christie initially admitted only to the murders of the women in the alcove and of his wife during police questioning. When informed about the skeletons buried in the back garden, 
he admitted responsibility for their deaths as well. On April 27, 1953, he confessed to the murder of Beryl Evans, which Timothy Evans had originally been charged with during the police investigation in 1949. Although for the most part he denied killing Geraldine. On one occasion following his trial, Christie indicated that he may have been responsible for her death as well, having said so to a hospital orderly. It is speculated that Christie would not have wanted to readily admit his guilt in Geraldine's death in order not to alienate the jury from his desire to be found not guilty by reason of insanity and for his safety from fellow inmates. On June 5, 1953, Christie confessed to the murders of Edie and First, which helped the police identify their skeletons. Christie was tried only for the murder of his wife Ethel. His trial began on June 22, 1953, in the same court in which Evans had been tried three years earlier. Christie pleaded insanity, with his defense describing him as mad as a March hare and claimed to have a poor memory of the events. Dr. Matheson, a doctor at HM Prison Brixton who evaluated Christie, was called as a witness by the prosecution. He testified, using medical terminology of the time, that Christie had a hysterical personality but was not insane. The jury rejected Christie's plea and after deliberating for 85 minutes found him guilty. He was sentenced to death by Mr. Justice Finnemore. On June 29, 1953, Christie stated that he would not be making an appeal against his conviction. On July 2, Evans' mother wrote to Christie asking him to confess all. On July 8, 1953, his MP George Rogers interviewed Christie for 45 minutes about the murders. The following day Christie spoke to the Scott Henderson inquiry about the murders. For days later the Home Secretary David Maxwell Fife said that he could not find any grounds, medically or psychologically, for Christie to be reprieved. Among Christie's final visitors whilst in the condemned cell were an ex-army friend, Dennis Haight, on July 13. The prison governor and his sister, Phyllis Clark, who visited him on the night before his execution. George Rogers also wanted to speak to Christie a second time on the night before his execution but Christie refused to meet him. Again, according to both Haig and his sister, Christie appeared resigned towards his death. Christie was hanged at 9 a.m. on July 15, 1953 at H.M. Prison Pentonville. His executioner was Albert Pierrepoint, who had hanged Evans. After being pinioned for execution, Christie complained that his nose itched. Pierrepoint assured him that, it won't bother you for long. After the execution, Christie's body was buried in an unmarked grave within the precincts of the prison, as was standard practice for executed prisoners in the United Kingdom. Victims Edit Ruth First, 21 Muriel Eady, 31 Beryl Evans, 20 Geraldine Evans, 13 months Ethel Christie, 54 Rita Nelson, 25 Kathleen Maloney, 26 Hector Ina McLennan, 26 Other murders Based on the pubic hair that Christie collected, it has been speculated that he was responsible for more murders than those carried out at 10, Rillington Place. He claimed that the four different clumps of hair in his collection came from his wife and the three bodies discovered in the kitchen alcove but only Ethel Christie matched the hair type on those bodies. Even if two of the others had come from the bodies of First and Edie, which had by then decomposed into skeletons, there was still one remaining clump of hair unaccounted for, it could not have come from Beryl Evans, as no pubic hair had been removed from her body. Writing in 1978, Professor Keith Simpson, one of the pathologists involved in the forensic examination of Christie's victims, had this to say about the pubic hair collection. It seems odd that Christie should have said hair came from the bodies in the alcove if in fact it had come from those now reduced to skeletons. 
Not very likely that in his last four murders the only trophy he took was from the one woman with whom he did not have perimortal sexual intercourse. And even more odd that one of his trophies had definitely not come from any of the unfortunate women known to have been involved. No attempts were or have been made to trace any further victims of Christie, such as examining records of missing women in London during his period of activity. Michael Edhouse suggested that Christie had been in a perfect position, as a special police constable during the war, to have committed many more murders than have been discovered. The historian Jonathan Oates considers it unlikely Christie had any further victims, arguing he would not have deviated from his standard method of killing in his place of residence. Innocence of Timothy Evans Main article, Timothy Evans Following Christie's conviction, there was substantial controversy concerning the earlier trial of Timothy Evans, who had been convicted mainly on the evidence of Christie, who lived in the same property in which Evans had allegedly carried out his crimes. Christie confessed to Beryl's murder and although he neither confessed to, nor was charged with, Geraldine's murder, he was widely considered guilty of both murders. This cast doubt on the fairness of Evans' trial and raised the possibility that an innocent person had been hanged. The controversy prompted the Home Secretary, David Maxwell Fife, to commission an inquiry led by John Scott Henderson QC, the recorder of Portsmouth, to determine whether Evans had been innocent and a miscarriage of justice had occurred. Henderson interviewed Christie before his execution as well as another 20 witnesses who had been involved in either of the police investigations. He concluded that Evans was in fact guilty of both murders and that Christie's confessions to the murder of Beryl were unreliable and made in the context of furthering his own defense that he was insane. Far from ending the matter, questions continued to be raised in Parliament concerning Evans' innocence, parallel with newspaper campaigns and books being published making similar claims. The Henderson inquiry was criticized for being held over too short a time period and for being prejudiced against the possibility that Evans was innocent, this controversy. Along with the coincidence that two stranglers would have been living in the same property at the same time if Evans and Christie had both been guilty, kept alive concerns that a miscarriage of justice had occurred in Evans' trial. This uncertainty led to a second inquiry, chaired by High Court Judge Sir Daniel Brabin, which was conducted over the winter of 1965-1966. Brabin re-examined much of the evidence from both cases and evaluated some of the arguments for Evans' innocence. His conclusions were that it was more probable than not that Evans had killed his wife, but not his daughter Geraldine, for whose death Christie was responsible. Christie's likely motive was that her presence would have drawn attention to Beryl's disappearance, which Christie would have been averse to as it increased the risk that his own murders would be discovered. Brabin also noted that the uncertainty involved in the case would have prevented a jury from being satisfied beyond reasonable doubt of Evans' guilt had he been retried. These conclusions were used by the Home Secretary, Roy Jenkins, to recommend a posthumous pardon for Evans, which was granted, as he had been tried and executed for the murder of his daughter. Jenkins announced the granting of Evans' pardon to the House of Commons on October 18, 1966. Evans' remains were subsequently exhumed and returned to his family, who arranged for him to be reburied in a private grave, there was already debate in the United Kingdom over the judicial killing. Evans' execution and other controversial cases contributed to the 1965 suspension and subsequent abolition of capital punishment in the United Kingdom. In January 2003, the Home Office awarded Evans' half-sister, Mary Westlake, and his sister, Eileen Ashby, ex gratia payments as compensation for the miscarriage of justice in his trial. The independent assessor for the Home Office, Lord Brennan QC, accepted that the conviction and execution of Timothy Evans for the murder of his child was wrongful and a miscarriage of justice in that. There is no evidence to implicate Timothy Evans in the murder of his wife. She was most probably murdered by Christie. Lord Brennan believed that the Brabin Report's conclusion that Evans probably murdered his wife should be rejected given Christie's confessions.